Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be what? Amen. Amen. There you go. Where should our eyes really be all the time? We get up in the morning, we meet with God. Where do we put our eyes? On Jesus. Say amen. Doesn't mean we don't drive our car. Doesn't mean we don't work. But geez, we're looking through the love of Jesus. When Jesus moved with compassion, he moved from his heart towards life, towards others. Can you say amen? So he did not formulate opinions before he got there. He allowed the Father to paint good pictures of everyone. Look at your neighbor and say, hey, you're looking pretty good there. <laughs> Amen. Good job. All right, now, so let me just give you this. First of all, as a Christian, know the difference. When you are reacting to something and you're responding to something, know the difference. How many know that the doctor gives you medicine and you have a reaction to it, is that a good thing? No. So Christians, we're learning not to react to our surroundings, but rather to respond with God. Can you say amen? Now, this is what happens. A lot of Christians, because maybe they don't know, maybe they're not trained, maybe somebody hasn't taken the time, or maybe they haven't spent any time with God, they don't know that reacting to things is exactly what the devil wants us to do. He wants to throw something, either by somebody suggesting something, or he wants to throw something into our mind and then watch and see if we react to it. We need to play poker face. How many has ever played poker? Okay. Sometimes, because he'll throw some things at us. Now, that's not God doing that. God's not involved in that. Because every time you advance, every time you grow, the enemy doesn't like it. He wants to hold us in bondage. He wants us to search for everything else to try to get us to be set free. And yet we have Almighty God. So he tries to work on the Christian to get their eyes to slip from looking unto Jesus rather to look at others. It can be dangerous to look at others. Say amen, somebody. It can be dangerous because we're like a camera. Or to look at the world's situation. Satan is the god of this world. So he's going to make a mess out of it. But you and I are not of this world anymore. Can you say amen? If we have been redeemed out of Egypt, out of the world. So we live in the kingdom. So our eyes need to be above and not on things below. Say amen. So we lean, lean to focus on Jesus, not on others, not on the world system, because it's passing away. And certainly, if you're a Christian, this is where we fail a lot. I do. We sometimes put our eyes on ourselves. Hello. And what I mean by that is we get on the defensive. Remember, I talked to you about that. If you think somebody's picking on you, turn them over to God. Don't get defensive, because Satan doesn't care. He'll use a peanut to make you upset. I got hit with a peanut. And I found out Pastor Kerry threw it. No, now listen to me. Remember, you are walking with... I know Michael got that. We're walking with God. We're supposed to be walking out of compassion, out of rest. Can you say amen? So if something is getting our goad, we need to go to God about it and then cast it over on the Lord. Don't carry anything that's going to get you out of phase. So again, eyes off. The world, eyes off other people, eyes off ourselves, because you'll never know if somebody says something wrong or you might take it wrong because your mind and your eyes are not on you. Say amen. And so you can actually judge yourself and look and see how you're doing. Lord, am I, am I finding myself frustrated more than I should be? Okay, remember I'm talking generalities. If you are just Pray and cast that over in the Lord. You might be carrying a little bit too much on your mind than you really need to be. Say amen, somebody. All right, so I hope you're learning on all of this. Okay, now, one of the main reasons I love to celebrate God is it took a miracle. It took a lot of God working through humanity to get his son into this world. Now, just think about it. Adam gave the earth, gave everything over to the devil. 
Satan, because God is legal and God has to obey, because God gave, even when God came to visit Adam when he owned the earth, he would visit and say, Adam, where are you? He would knock on his door. Because God always honors what's yours. So if you don't give it to him, then it's not his. It's yours. So I like to give everything God gave me back over to God. Say amen. He makes it run better, work better. Anyway, so Adam, he knocked on Adam's door. Where are you, Adam? We found out Adam sinned. And the devil says, all right, God, you're out of here. So can you imagine God being legal and then Adam saying he gave his life over to the devil and now the devil says, now he's mine, you get out of here. Can you imagine the sensation of that nastiness? Don't get on past that though. Jesus, that's why Jesus is coming and that's why Jesus came and that's why Jesus rose again. That's why Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father so that you and I can get off of this planet until God renovates it and changes it. Say amen. A new heaven and a new earth, the Bible says. Wherein is righteousness. So let's go on. Let's get into Four areas. Everyone say four areas. Okay, the first one is the one true three-in-one God. I'm going to talk about God for a minute and show you the fallacies. There's a lot of bad teaching out there, and some are Christians allowing it. Everyone say, I was not made in the test tube. I was created by God. Amen. When Adam and Eve were created, he brought him out of the dust of the earth. Not out of a test tube, can you say amen? And there's a lot of poor teachings about God. They are, they're beast people for some reason because of the word, and I'm going to cover this, because of the word Elohim, um, they think that God is more of a council than an individual. No. God didn't say, hey guys, I decided to make man in our image. What do you all think? God never did that. But that's what's being taught out there. Although ancient aliens and these things teach that the aliens come down and made us in a little test tube. Now, I know you don't need to hear that, but you're going to hear it. People are going to bring it up all the time, talk about it. And you're going to say, no, let me tell you the real truth about our God. So you ready? Take some notes. So two, we're going to talk about God spoke the end of the serpent's reign. God spoke the end of the enemy. How many know that God speaks it and it comes to pass? Thirdly, we're going to talk about he came as it was written of him. Jesus came in the volume that was written of him to fulfill God's will. Now, let me ask you, if Jesus messed up and didn't do that, would he qualify to die for our sins? No, he would not. He had to fulfill everything that the demand of the law, the penalty for our sin, and pay the price and fulfill all the prophets and all the things that are written of him. Say amen, somebody. And then finally, fourthly, we're going to cover the word became flesh for us to behold. The word became flesh for us to behold him. Mary, did you know the baby that you kissed 
is your father. You know, it's just this amazing thing. And Lord, you made the tree that they hung you on. Amen. You made, you designed the stakes that they drove through your nail, the nails of your hands and into your feet. Think about that. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what you do. I've, I've joined God. How about you? Put your hands up. So I, I surrender and join God. See, that's what we do. And we do that kind of like on a daily basis th so that the enemy has nothing to accuse you. You see, I, I don't call myself wise, but I do know when God tells me to teach something, I will do it until I die. And he says, when you teach my people to meet with me, I write every wrong before they even start their day. So wouldn't that be a good thing to do? Yeah. Meet with God. Present yourself to him. Ask you for cleansing, washing. Just do it automatically. Like taking a shower. How many here? I love to take showers. Can't do it as readily as I want. But I love, I love to, you know, feel that refreshing rain, that refreshing, right? So we need that every day because you and I get clammy. Hello? It's what we catch. All righty. Okay, so let's go through these. We've gone through four points. Now we're going to cover them. Okay, you ready? The one true God, three in one. So you need to know this. Everyone say Elohim. Elohim is a plural name meaning more than one, but it's a single word with meaning more than one member. Okay? So somebody had to start somewhere. Somebody had to be the original. My question was, when I first got saved, is who created God? He always was, is the answer. I don't know how that is, but I'm going to ask when I get there. But there is three main, three original, one God. Everyone say three in one. They're called Elohim. Okay? So we need to understand because there is a lot of copies and sections of Elohim that God created to serve him. We call them angels, spirit beings, hello, amen. Those are Elohim too, but they don't create planets. They don't make people. Can you say amen? There's only three that are the original one. And let me show you where that is. All right, go with me to Genesis chapter one, please. Just verse 26. Maybe somebody get me a water. That would be great. Alan, could you grab me a water? Fred, it's good to see you. Bless you, brother. All right, Genesis 1, 26. This is God speaking. Look at what he said. Look at the term, let us, our, us and our, okay? So it goes in Genesis chapter 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air over the cattle over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth in the earth amen so let us create man in our image who's talking this is the father thank you brother the father's talking here's something about the father you might not know God the Father's never got off the throne. He's never moved off the throne. He can't. He's above all, through all, and in you all. Okay? He's what keeps the flowers growing, the birds from singing. He's the one who keeps everything running. That's his grace, overall grace. When you were born and you have breath in your lungs and your heart beats, that's his overall grace. The Father's above everything. Father knows no time. He's in the past all the way to the future. So you can actually go back in your past and ask him to heal something. It'll come right up into the future. We'll talk about that when we talk about divine healing. So your father, who's above all, through all, and in all. Okay, you'll find that in Ephesians 4. Then you have the word. Everyone say the word. You see, in the beginning, Jesus Christ wasn't the Christ. He was the word. He was called the word because he's the spoken part of God. He's not... He's not a, a segment of God. He's an individual, but the spoken part of God. All right? So now we have a father, and now we have Jesus. He's the one where you get all your action names for. People called him Jehovah. 
Because the Lord, our provider, the Lord, our banner, the Lord, our, our healer, hello, Jehovah. So Jesus actually was the moving part with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, and he was called the angel of the Lord, okay? All the other angels have names, but he was called the angel of the Lord. And you'll see at certain accounts, people bowed to him. He didn't even say, get up, I'm an angel. No, he said, and they just bowed to him because he was the Lord. He just came in the likeness of an angel. Moses in the burning bush, it said an angel spoke out, but it actually was Christ. Before he became the Christ, everyone say, I'm getting it. So you have a father, the word. And then you have the Holy Spirit. So it works like this. God spoke. The Holy Spirit began to hover. And he brought it to pass. So the Father calls. Jesus saves. And the Holy Spirit brings everything to pass. So all three are working together. So say Elohim. Three in one. One in three. Okay. So let's see that. So let us create man in our image. Did you know you're a three-part being? God is a three-part being. You are spirit, soul, and body. Let us make man in our image. So it wasn't a committee. It wasn't a congregation of all the Elohim getting together and go, I think that would be a good idea, God. No. God the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit went into action and made man in their image. Say amen. Now, there's another scripture I want to give to you. It's in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. It tells us that very thing. I'll go over it real quickly again. So when you see, it says God... Elohim, there's three. Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. Now what happened, see we're studying about the Word becoming flesh, so Jesus is going to become human. So here we got, watch what happens here. Okay, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, this is he who came by water and blood. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ, not only by water, natural birth, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness. Now listen, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the what? All right, now, Jesus, he was a body. He had a body. Holy Spirit has a body, and the Father has a body. So it's hard for us to imagine that, but they're all one in total agreement. Now we have the word army, okay? One word, right? But does an army have more than one member? Yeah. yeah. God is one word, three members, the original three. Say, I got it. And did you know more than half of the body of Christ can't explain the Trinity like I just explained it? It's simple. It's not hard. They want to complicate it. Three in one, they want to use an egg or they want to use water, vaporize, ice. It's none of the above. Each one's an individual, but they cannot work without the other. Okay? And they designed everything else that's created. All the good. Everyone say there's a bad person out there, but God didn't create him that way. He created him. He created Lucifer good. And, and he turned bad. How many of you know we're good? But we can turn bad. Say, thank God I'm going to avoid it. All right. So, so it says, and there are three that bear record to heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, the word Elohim is a single word describing more than one person. Like the word army, one army having more than one person. Two, the term, let us, is the Father talking to the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, all three are involved in every move that God moves. Three, our Father gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, when we accept Jesus, this is really cool. God puts us in him. We not only accept Jesus Christ in our heart, didn't we? Say amen, somebody. 
But then he takes us and puts us in him. If any man be in Christ. So there's a miracle going on in your life we're, we're not always aware of. But you're in as much in God as God is in you. Hello? That means when you get up in the morning, don't see yourself. You're focused on the wrong thing. Get up in the morning, ignore yourself, and proceed your, on to God. Then he'll show you how he's designed you to be, and you'll find out your faith flows. It's not so much a trial every day. Come on, say amen, somebody. Fourthly, Jesus was born in the natural and in the likeness of sin, yet without sin, so that he can condemn and he could break the penalty of sin for you and I. Say amen. How many here remember the story of the Good Samaritan? There was a certain man who went from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, and they stripped him, wounding him, leaving him half dead. Okay, and then there was a certain man, came to where he was, saw that he needed help, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. But when the Levi, or when the high priest came, they couldn't do anything, so they passed by the other side. Who is the good Samaritan? Jesus Christ. He came to where our fallen state was. He bound up our wounds, pouring in oil, the Holy Spirit, and, and the wine, newness of life. And he bound up the wounds, stuck us on his own donkey, led us to the innkeeper, the Holy Spirit says, take care of them that when I come again, I will pay you anything I owe. You read the Good Samaritan, and we'll go over it sometime with you, breaking it down. It is a, a dispensational breakdown of what Jesus was going to do for humanity and what he does at the right hand of the Father. Someone say amen. Man, I done preached myself excited. All right, let's go to our second point. God spoke the end of the serpent's rule. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 3. We see the fall of man, the fall of Lucifer. We're going to look at verse 14 and 15, Genesis 3. God is speaking to the serpent, the snake. And he says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any cattle, more than all every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall sit, uh, eat dust all the days of your life. Now, everybody think, well, yeah, snakes, they crawl around the dust, they're over in the hot. Blah, 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 blah. No, he's not talking about a natural creature. He's talking about a two-legged serpent-type cherubim that fell, came into the garden, and destroyed Adam and Eve's connection with God. He says, because you've done this thing, I'm going to remove you, and you're not going to get off of this planet. You're going to crawl around in the dust and, and the junk that, that you created. And so we find the serpent in three areas. This is just extra information. He's in the air, prince of power of the air. Next time the flu comes around, cast it down so you don't get it. You ever look at a flu bug? It looks like a little dragon demon. In, in, the, in the glass. It's something to see. I think, we, I think sometimes we're asleep. We need to wake up. He's on the earth. How many know he's raising havoc with the nations right now? Look over the Middle East and all. So he's in the air, on the earth. Now this is just him. God is far more powerful, has far more angels. God is just passive aggressive. You have to ask him. If you don't ask him, no. He'll just generally help you on somebody else's prayers. And then fourthly, he's under the earth. Everyone see under the earth? So Satan is dwelling under the earth, not in hell, but under the earth. He's got caverns in there. He's on the ground and he's in the air. So let me show you the scripture. Jesus is Lord of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. So, see, enemy dug in. So just for us to know, we can't really get up and get started in our day without first presenting ourselves to God. So he shields us so that we can get on with our Father's business. Say amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. All right, point two. So, so in Genesis 3, verse 14, we read that part. Look at verse 15. 
Here's God speaking. He says, I will put enmity or division between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And he, Jesus, shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Now, let me ask you, did Satan try to chase the Messiah around and try to kill him before his time? Yes. Did he try to kill Moses before his time? Yes. Because the devil didn't know who the Messiah was. So he kept going over every righteous person trying to kill him. See, so remember, he's trying to control this planet. And he did all up until the time Jesus came. When Jesus came and was born in a manger from Mary, he came. He was the complete answer of the purchase price for our salvation and the purchase price for this earth back. Jesus became our last sacrifice. Say amen. I got to drink some water. I done preached myself happy. Are you getting anything out of this? All right. Again, it's the idea is to give to you the whole picture so that you can operate with God in the earth. You are part of God's rescue plan. Believe it or not, you're a saved child of God. God says, will you go out into my fields? The man had two sons. He said to the one, will you go out to my fields because the harvest is ripe? He says, I will, sir, but didn't. Then the other son, he went to the other son and says, will you go out to my fields and share your faith with others? And he says, no, I don't want to go out in the field. But he changed his mind and went. Let me ask you, which one was the justified one? The one that went. You see, we can say whatever we want. But he that does the will of God shall abide forever. True maturity comes when you do the will of God, even if you don't feel like it. Someone say, oh, me. Now, everyone look at me. I love you. So anyway, so let me go on to this. This is going to be good. So let's look at this. All right. So he said, I will put enmity. So who is the seed of the woman? His name is Jesus. Jesus. Let me ask you, does a woman have a seed? No, she has an egg. Yeah, you have an egg, ladies. Guys, you have a seed. Now, here's a weird thing. How can a woman have a seed? Unless the seed comes from God. And the reason the seed had to come from God, so you know, is the blood stain, cursed blood of Adam can't be passed on the Messiah because he then would be disqualified. So God had to become born of a virgin without male blood being involved, no sex. And the Holy Spirit came into her womb and she said, let it be done to me according to your word. And the word came into her womb and took on flesh. And she carried the word. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And then it says in John 1.14, which I'm getting ahead of myself, and the word became flesh and he was born. Hello? No tainted blood. So he could shed his pure blood for our tainted blood and make the perfect sacrifice. Someone say, hallelujah. Merry Christmas. Celebration. Yeah. Yeah, it's a celebration. So look at, so we'll go down to John, 1 John chapter 3 now. Now look at this. This is really cool. 1 John 3, in, in the likeness of this point, God spoke the end of the serpent's rule. He says in 1 John chapter 3, 7 through 9, little children, let no one deceive you. Boy, there's a lot of that. Evidently, they want us not deceived. He who practices righteousness is righteous. But he who is righteous, just as he is righteous, but he who sins is of the who? Yeah, see, remember, sins. I'm going to give you this. When you see the word sin... It means the nature of Satan. When you see the word sins with an S, it means the product or the fruit of the sin nature means doing wrong. Just means doing wrong. So if we want to stop doing wrong, we get closer to God. So he checks us and keeps us balanced. Say amen. 
Now, the other day I made mention that sometimes we suffer certain things. How do we recognize when the enemy is wrong? Because everything, the enemy gives himself away. He can't mask himself. Hello. He can appear for a moment as an angel of light, but everything he does is broken. He breaks things. He messes things up. So listen, this is to me, not to you. When you get in an area of, of your life, how many's ever heard the term accident prone? You know, where a series of accidents happen, we go, why is that happening? That's usually demonic. When there's a series of broken things, not your past, this has nothing to do with your past. It has to do with the present. A series of broken things happening over and over and again, a serious prayer needs to be made so you can break that so the enemy doesn't get to us. Amen. Remember, I never preach at anyone. If I have a problem with you, I don't have any problem say, look, let's deal with this. Have I ever backed off? No. So why would anybody, except for the devil's lies, tell you that I'm picking on you if I haven't mentioned you personally? Right, Carrie? <laughs> so anyway, and, and you say, it, could he be referring? I'm referring to all of you. Time or two, the devil will have a little heyday with you and will get you mad at me. But don't let you do it, because I'll spank you. <laughs> All right. And please don't, you know, don't worry about anything. Your pastor loves you dearly, and I'm also your friend. Okay? Everyone say, thank you, Pastor Carrie. Thank you for telling me what I need and not what I want to hear. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so uh, let's go on. All right, so listen to this. This is great. He says, but he who sins of the devil... The this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Who has been born of God does not sin. Who lives in you? God, doesn't he? So what is God doing in you? He's destroying the works of the devil. Say amen. But it's not going to do any good if you don't get him up in your thinking, get him out where you're acting, so he can work on the outer man. Say amen. But he's born of God. Look at this next phrase. Because you have Jesus in you. It says, he that's born of God does not sin. For his seed, Jesus, remains in him. He cannot sin because he's been born of God. Now, if you're not reading a lot of John, you won't understand this. John never talks about the natural man. He talks in, in some specifics. He says, if you can't walk in love, you're not of God. Hello? Think of that. If you can't walk in love, you're not of God. Now, I don't know about it. There's sometimes I'm not in love. So that means I'm not of God? No. Listen to what he's saying. Love projects us, and love causes us to minister out of the realm of Christ. And when we walk in that love realm, it's not a natural love, it's a spiritual love of the Spirit. When we walk in that, we cannot sin. When you're under the flow of God, when you're under the Spirit of God, the last thing you think about is sinning. Say amen. That's what he's saying. If you've got God on the inside of you, the God in you and your spirit, which have become one, does not think about sinning. It comes from your unrenewed mind and your unrenewed flesh. That thinks about sinning. So that's why we present ourselves to God every day to kill and shut this down so that it's not causing us to be a flake. Someone look at your neighbor and say, thank God all the flakes are in eastern Washington. <laughs> I'm just talking about, you know, snowflakes, and I'm not putting anybody really down. But we're fla we become flaky when we allow our emotions to cause us to go back and forth. No, we are purposeful. We have a God. We follow him. And you know what? We're not like some, and excuse, I'm trying to find the word, some fish out of water just flopping all around. Take a look around you, though. There are plenty of Christians that are like that. Let me ask you, how are you doing? Do you get your feelings hurt easily? Don't say yes. Say no. <laughs> If you find that there are certain times you get your feelings hurt easily, guard that because that's where the enemy picks up and tries to get us offensed or offended. All right, say, I got it so far. 
Couple of points. Church, our Heavenly Father spoke to the serpent and declared his end. Can you say amen? So the next time the devil reminds you, Tracy, about your past and tells you about all the bad things you experienced in your past, smile and say, thank you, Father, and turn to him and say, let me remind you about your future. You're going to hell, buddy. And just lift your hands and start praising the Lord. It'll drive him insane. It'll drive the devil. He's insane already. But you know what? I'm tired of people getting intimidated by the devil. We can intimidate him just by getting up in the morning and praising God. Did you know that? Just by lifting up the name of Jesus, you intimidate him. Because he's stripped. He's lost his authority. He's a thief. He's a robber. He's a liar. There's no truth in him. He's kill you if he could, but he can't touch you because you walk with God, say amen. You dwell within your head, say amen. You got the almighty God back in you, living with you, and dwelling around you. Now, if there's any failures there, had to be some of us. Can't be the Lord, say amen. And so, if you ever feel short, if you ever feel like, you know, oh gosh, you know, I need some help. Do not put yourself down. God is right there to lift you up. Say amen. All right, our third point. He came through what was written of him. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Literally, the word, the word of God had to come through the, the prophets and through Moses and through all the different people declaring about him coming. The first one is Genesis 3.15. I put an enmity between the woman's seed and your seed, and he will crush your head, serpent. And so we see that there's a spiritual war going on over the lost souls of people. It's like a chess game. God makes a move, and Satan does a counter move. And, and God makes a move, and, and Satan tries to take a counter move. But see, God knows the ending because all the way from the beginning to the ending. And in his knowing that, he's got everything set up. But he has to get our attention so that we don't step in the devil's traps. So we walk with our shepherd and we walk not religiously but faithfully so that he can keep us away from the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. Say amen, somebody. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Look at this. Talking about Jesus. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, you know, the sacrificing of animals and the blood and all, but a body you have prepared for me. Jesus is saying, look, I was born as a human. You gave me a physical body for one reason. So you said, verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, no S, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come in the volume of the book, which is written of me, to do your will, O God. See, this is Jesus talking. Previously, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, but had no pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Verse 9. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, to take away the first covenant and establish the second, that the will of God may have been sacrificial through the offering of the body of Jesus. What did he say? A body you have prepared for me. Why was a body given to Jesus? Wasn't he God? Because he had to become human to die for humans. God cannot die. Can you say amen? God cannot die. So Jesus, remember when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit? He gave back the God part. And he went down into hell as a human being all by himself with our sins and our diseases. And he walked right over and as his blood was being honored by the Father, you know, and notice that the Holy Spirit says that God the Father had raised him from the dead. Once that blood was analyzed, no sin or no fault was found. The blood was atoned, and God raised Jesus from the dead. Just before Jesus left, he walked right over there, slapped Satan in the face, and took the keys. And says, you're done. You're completely done. 
And of course, the enemy doesn't think he's done, so he keeps on acting like he isn't. And then he went over to Abraham's bosom. Everyone say Abraham's bosom. And he says, look at Abraham. Look at Lot. Look at all your righteous people. You were held captive here because of man's sin. But now I've atoned for it and I'm leading you all free. Let's go to heaven. And he led all captivity free. And then he turned right around and sent the Holy Spirit to us and said, the Holy Spirit, if you'll buddy up with him in Christ, he will give you supernatural power and supernatural gifts, and you'll be able to be an ambassador for me, to represent me with power. Everyone say power, power. not wimpiness. All right. So he says now, a couple of points. Notice Jesus became the last and the final sacrifice for you and I. That's why when Jesus says, by his stripes, you were healed. You don't try to get healed. You ask God to help you accept the healing he has for you. Say amen. Are you still trying to get saved? No, you believed and received salvation that he had for you. And by the way, the word salvation means healing, mean wholeness, being preserved, being protected, being watched over. So say, I'm saved. You're healed, you're whole, you're being watched over, protected. Say, amen. But see, you're growing in knowing. You're growing in knowing. Amen? We're learning more, and grace and peace are multiplied through the more of the knowledge of God that we have. Ah, got to take another sip of water. So, Jesus stripped Satan of every bit of authority he has except for one thing. Because Adam gave his life to the devil, Satan has the right to tempt you to see if you're going to give your life to him. Now, there's only two. We think we're living our own life, but no, there's only two. You're serving one or the other and sometimes both during the day. Now, not as a Christian. Please don't get that wrong. Now, as a Christian... All you want is God. Say amen. You want him to filter out in your life things that have been misprogrammed in your brain and things that have hurt you, but he'll restore and wash that away as you continue to fellowship with him day by day. Say amen. And thirdly, Jesus was born here to walk the will of the Father to completely finish the demands of the sin of the law and its demands on our life. And then he turns around. He says, don't be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So guess what? Heaven's our home. Everyone say, heaven's my home. There's nobody but you can keep yourself from heaven. Satan can't keep you there. I mean, can't, can't stop you from going there. And, and no one else can stop you from going to heaven. Only your choices. And you've already made a choice for God, so you're sealed. All aboard the gospel train. Tickets paid and your seats reserved. All right? Just get on board. Amen. So we join. We hear about the Ark of the Covenant, you know, Noah's Ark. We hear about Noah's Ark. We'll use the, the Ark. What is that? That's a type of the rapture. First of all, we have to get in the boat. Can you say amen? And getting in the boat is receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Once we're in the boat, how many know we're headed to the other side? Heaven is your home. So when he told his disciples, everyone, we're going to the other side, did he lie? When they saw the storms of life, did Jesus lie? They got to the other side, didn't they? Well, guess what? God says, you're going to the other side. You're going to make heaven. Now, I'm going to talk about me. What, let's say today, something happened, I die. An accident or something. God forbid, I'm not claiming any of that. Guess what? I graduate. <laughs> See, that's the way you got to start looking at things so Satan doesn't have any fear on you. Doesn't lay any fear on you. Because we already got a seal on us. We already got our tickets paid and our seats reserved. And we're not going to give that up. Can you say amen? 
Not only that, but you got to tell everybody there's plenty of other seats reserved for them too. Just invite them to accept Jesus into their heart. Get that seed in them. All right, my last point. The word became flesh. And before we go there, go with me to John 10. John chapter 10. I want to let you know it's very important that you let Jesus lead your life. Imagine him. Well, the Bible says he's for us. Can everyone say amen? The Bible says he's for us. Any man, but God be for us. Who can be against? God is with us. Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And then God is in us. Say amen. Amen. That means when you accept Jesus Christ, God comes into you. Amen. And then we are forth in God. Everyone say in God. If any man be in Christ, you're hidden in Christ in God. Can you say amen? Now think about that. Do you get up every morning with that on your mind? Well, listen, we should, but it's good. I have to put it on my mind. Who I am in Christ, who I'm not without Christ. What am I going to lean on? My own understanding or I'm going to lean on the things of the Lord? All right, so let me read this to you. This is John 10, 1 through 4. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by, by the door, but climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber. In the Bible, who's a thief and a robber? Was he born in this planet? No. So Satan didn't have any say in this planet until he conned Adam, who was born in this planet, or created in this planet, to give him his authority. So guess what? It says, he does not come in by the door, the same as a what? Thief and robber. Who didn't come in by the door being born here naturally? Satan. He stole his authority from Adam. Now, now you know why Jesus had to be born. Once Jesus was born in the earth, he took over man's authority and took his own authority and combined them. He's called the man Christ Jesus. The hypostatic union. All God, all man. All man, all God. As a man, he relates to man. As God, he relates to God. Hello. Christ Jesus, God, man. Jesus Christ, man, God. That's not his last name. That's who he is. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. You see, he was born here naturally. To him, the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Then he goes before them and leads his own sheep out and they follow him for they do not follow strangers. Have you gotten so close to God you know him and recognize him leading your life? If not, let's get you there because you'll be able to recognize stranger danger, stranger danger. That's weird, that's stranger danger. I love to do little hand me things like that. Get around somebody, say, hey, man, let's, let's go drink a beer, smoke a joint. Stranger danger! Stranger danger! Remember when the kids were told, stay away from strangers? Okay, good. I, she looked concerned. <laughs> if Christians would just get it together and recognize if, if it doesn't glorify God, don't hang around it. Stranger danger. All right, enough said there. All right, John chapter 1, please, verses 1 through Five and then 10 through 14, the word become flesh. In the beginning was the word. She had three, the bare record in heaven, the Father, the word, the Holy Spirit. And the word was with God and the word was God. Now look at this next phrase. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. It doesn't say by him, through him. So the Father worked through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. All things were created through him. 
And without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life. Everyone say life. And look at what the phrase says. And the life was the light of men. Let me explain. The word light there is the Greek word zoe. Everyone say zoe. You might know somebody with that name. It means the life and divine nature of God. It doesn't mean just living. It's the life and divine nature of God. Okay? So put that in there, like I'm going to do right now. Okay? And without him, nothing was made. He is the life, the divine nature and essence of God. And that life was the light of men. So guess what? Before we were saved, we were dark. Completely dark with all the things of the enemy. We were in sin. We were headed for the wrong place. And then when we accepted Jesus Christ, he gave us his life. And in that life, outshines his light. And God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Let that light so shine before men that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. It goes on further to say, and that light was the light of men, and the light shines into darkness, the darkness of our heart, the darkness of this world, and the darkness did not conquer or understand it. In verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. See, they rejected Jesus. But as many as received him, Jew or Gentile, to them he gave the right to become a children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, of natural birth, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. Jesus Christ became flesh, see, and dwelt among us. And we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You need more grace? Grace and peace are multiplied through the knowledge of him. You need more truth? Jesus said, you know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And finishing, folks. Church, the word came to do what we are supposed to do, to release us so that we can follow God out of our own love for him. Say amen. God never forces any of us to follow him. The forcer is Satan. He's the one that pushes. He's the one that seems aggressive. Remember, God is passive aggressive. Satan is just aggressive. He's no friend of anyone. So, you have to ask God. You have to invite God. You have to befriend God. You got to want God on a daily basis. Because God has to have the legal right of your invitation for him to work with us. Say amen. amen. I, I don't come to, let's, let's use uh, Diana. I don't come to Diana's house door and burst in. That's breaking and entering. That's what Satan did to this planet. But God came and he knocked. And also to our heart. Notice God never forced any of us to get saved. He knocked. And we opened our heart and said, God, come on in. And if you want to follow me, I said, come on in. Make your home here. Dwell here. Anytime you need, you're weary, you need some food or anything, you come on these five acres, God. Bring your entourage. You just will. Everything's open and ready for you. Now, we know that's ridiculous. He doesn't ever get tired. But the idea is we want our heart. Lord, write your story on my heart. Lord, let my heart make room for what you want to do. And you guys are so precious. I love you dearly. I've never had such a good congregation. So you guys be blessed today. Did you get something out of that? Will you give the Lord a praise? Amen.